Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 4. Making Ireland English. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Before we begin today's episode, I highly recommend the Ages of Conquest podcast. David and the team are the same guys behind the massively successful YouTube channels, The Cold War and Kings and Generals. Now in its second season, Ages of Conquest is covering the history of the Mongol Empire, because after all, when it comes to conquering, few can match the Mongols. If you've played Ghosts of Tsushima, which came out recently, they've just done a series on the Mongol invasions of Japan, or at least attempted invasions of Japan. You can find Ages of Conquest on all good podcast apps. In this fourth episode of the new season, we will see how the Laudianism of the Church of England influenced the independence of the Church of Ireland. The new Lord Deputy, Sir Thomas Wentworth, will cooperate with Lord on these religious reforms as they sought to impose their thorough policy. We will also cover how Wentworth ruthlessly imposed his and his king's authority at the expense of any obstacle in Irish society. Whether you were a New English landlord or an Anglo-Irish aristocrat, standing in the way of Wentworth's policies had consequences. However, as we will also see, through his uncompromising methods, the Lord Deputy would sow the seeds of his own destruction. We saw in the last episode that Wentworth arrived in Ireland with three objectives, and one overall aim. The first objective had been to repair the finances of the kingdom, the second was to reform the Irish church, and the third was to anglicise the Irish. By succeeding in these three points, he would accomplish his overall aim, the unquestioned authority of the king in his Irish kingdom. We saw how Wentworth successfully wrangled Parliament to secure taxation, though at the cost of alienating significant Catholic interests. In this episode, we'll see how Wentworth went about his other two aims, and judge how successful he was in them. Wentworth's second objective, to bring the Church of Ireland closer to the Church of England, was resisted. James Usher, who appeared in Season 1, Episode 37, The Graces, was now Archbishop of Ermere, and Primate of All Ireland. He had been critical of the Graces, as sacrificing the immortal souls of the Irish in return for money. It's possible to see Usher as the Church of Ireland's William Lord. He wanted to reform his church. He was vocally critical of much of his clergy, complaining to his English counterpart of the drunkenness and scandalous life of unworthy ministers. As we will see, though, Usher was determined to ensure the Church of Ireland's independence from the Church of England. He wished his church to learn from Lord's Church, not to become subservient to it. Wentworth shared much of Usher's complaints about the Irish Church. On his arrival, he complained that its clergy was untrained, that its buildings were in disrepair, that multiple positions were held by the same person. The ceremonies were inconsistent, and the church was chronically underfunded due to most of its land being held by lay landlords. Many of these complaints would have been very familiar to Laudian reformers in England. Wentworth was joined in Dublin by his fellow Yorkshireman, John Bramhall, who had been Wentworth's chaplain but now rapidly climbed the ranks of the Irish church, reaching a bishopric by 1634. Both Wentworth and Bramhall wished to bring the Church of Ireland into alignment with the English canons of 1604 and the 39 Articles. The Church of Ireland operated under the 1615 Articles of Faith, which were much more Calvinist in nature than their English counterparts. These articles had been established at the same time that the Irish Parliament met, and, in a way, were an expression of independence from the Church of England. Puritan critics of Laudianism often pointed to the Irish Church as well as the Scottish Kirk as proof that their beliefs were not only tolerated, but in favour in the other two Stuart kingdoms. 
to bring the Irish Church into alignment with the English, and to remove this useful example of Calvinism, a convocation of the Irish Church was summoned in 1634 to approve the English Articles. But it wasn't the rubber stamp committee that Wentworth hoped for. Archbishop Usher attempted to have the Irish Articles approved alongside the English, and Wentworth threatened that he would, with the King's authority, enforce the English Articles with or without the consent of the Convocation. The English Articles were approved, but naturally this my way or the highway approach did not lead to a passionate enforcement of the Articles, as we will see. It was the canons of 1604 which caused the most controversy. The Convocation objected to several of the canons as not being applicable to Ireland, which, since they had been drafted three decades previously and for an entirely different kingdom, made a certain amount of sense. The Convocation wished to keep its relaxed attitude towards conformity. Ireland was a mix of cultures and religions. It was only practical to turn a blind eye to some errors if the intention was good. Usher threatened to resign his post if the English canons were applied without revision. This resistance irritated Wentworth, who said the convocation was acting most unlike clergymen. For Bramall and Lord, however, this wasn't the end of the world. It may have even been a blessing in disguise. The 1604 canons could do with some revising, after all. And if the changes worked in Ireland, then it would be much simpler to apply them to England too. So, in 1635, the convocation agreed to a refined set of canons. Of the 141 English canons, dozens were left on the cutting room floor. I'll quote from Colm Lennon's chapter in the Cambridge History of Ireland, Protestant Reformations 1550-1641. It's a bit lengthy, but it provides some useful examples of the changes found in the Irish reforms. The 39 articles were no more than a starting point, as the Irish set omitted, added, and changed a great deal to take account of the theological sensitivities of early 17th century Irish Protestantism. For example, English Articles 35 and 36, referring to homilies and the consecration of bishops and priests respectively, were dropped. In the first case, because of Puritan objections to reading sermons written by others, and in the second, due to non-conformist doubts about the episcopacy among some Protestants in Ireland. A Puritan mentality was also attested in the Articles in respect of church organisation, biblical authority, and the sacredness of the Sabbath. Above all, the 104 Articles were notable for their anti-Roman thrust. Article 80 holds that the Pope was that man of sin, foretold in the Holy Scriptures. And there was a much greater emphasis spread over seven Articles on the Calvinist tenant of predestination. God's eternal decree of salvation for certain numbers of the just, which was the limit of the English article's profession, was balanced by that of reprobation of fixed numbers of the damned, or double predestination. The Irish articles were a reflection of how the church had fared in the decades since its establishment and an answer to new challenges thrown up by a half-century of theological debate. The Church of Ireland emerged as a small community of the predestined, elect among the damned, beset by signs of the Antichrist, and shaped by Calvinistic and Puritan influences. The 1635 reforms received a lukewarm reception. For his part, Usher simply ordered newly trained clergy to adhere to the 39 Articles and the Irish Articles, despite bowing to pressure at the Convocation. Passive resistance became the name of the game, and unsurprisingly, the large Scottish population in Ulster became a hotbed of resistance. As we'll see in our upcoming Scottish episodes, Scottish Presbyterianism was deeply hostile to Laudian reforms. Bramall complained that the supply of new religious dissenters from Scotland prevented a proper reform of the Church of Ireland. To attempt to enforce compliance, Wentworth revived the Court of High Commission in Ireland, though its decisions were subjected to the oversight of its English counterpart. Clergy who agreed with the reforms 
found valuable patronage from Wentworth and support from Lord, and were promoted. Wentworth did what he could to recruit good Lordian clergy from England, but often had to promote from within Ireland and from those who would oppose the reforms, if only out of political and practical necessity. Trinity College Dublin, once a particularly Calvinist institution, gained Lord as its new Chancellor. He rewrote the Charter with the intention of producing the right sort of clergy. Much like in England, the Church's financial position was dire, and Wentworth's government sought to fix it. Church lands had their leases to laity reduced to a 21-year limit, except in Ulster. Bishops began to renew these leases at increased rents, reclaiming land when and where they could. Wentworth used both the Court of High Commission and the Court of Castle Chamber, itself the counterpart to Star Chamber, to seize church lands when possible. Wentworth had not come to Ireland to make friends, and he was quite happy to step on as many toes as he needed to to get the job done. This included Richard Boyle, 1st Earl of Cork, who complained bitterly of the amount he now had to pay in taxes following Parliament, after several years of avoiding it entirely. The Lord Deputy had little sympathy for his plight. As far as Wentworth was concerned, Cork's accumulation of wealth had been at the expense of the Crown, and Cork was an overmighty subject who needed to be taken down a notch. On a purely personal level, Wentworth found the Earl to be a pretentious social upstart. In 1634, Wentworth publicly humiliated the Earl by ordering him to dismantle a vast and expensive memorial for his late wife in Dublin's St. Patrick's Cathedral. Officially, this was because it was in the east end of the church, where the communion table was now meant to stand, and he was allowed to rebuild it in another part of the cathedral. Still, this has been seen as both a petty act of cruelty and a shot across the bow for the new English elite. Wentworth was here to enforce the rules, and your station would not grant you protection. With this humiliation over, Wentworth then went after the church property which Cork had accumulated, accusing him in Castle Chamber of having gained it illegally. A deal was eventually reached whereby Cork would pay £15,000 and have some of the land revoked, but would keep the rest. After further attacks on his property in 1637, Cork left Ireland for England. Cork had been temporarily put in his place, but this is not the last time we'll see him. Cork and Wentworth would manage to maintain some level of cooperation over the following years, but it would never recover, and Cork would have the opportunity to get his revenge on Wentworth in due course. A worse fate awaited the Vice-Treasurer of Ireland, Francis Ainsley, Viscount Mount Norris. Mount Norris had initially been an ally of Wentworth, but the two fell out over Wentworth's reform of the customs duties. Under the existing arrangement, the tax farmers who actually collected the duties benefited more than the Crown, even with the increase in trade during this period. Mount Norris himself was one of the beneficiaries, and Wentworth wanted his resignation. With Mount Norris out of the way, the system could be reformed, and a greater proportion of the profits would go to the government, and a small amount to Wentworth himself, of course. Mount Norris was unwilling to resign and so Wentworth resorted to extreme measures. At a dinner with the Lord Chancellor in spring 1635, Mount Norris commented on how a relative of his had dropped a stool on Wentworth's foot. He stated that this might have been deliberate, retribution for the Lord Deputy hitting Mount Norris's brother with a cane for insubordination. Then, Mount Norris was reported saying the following. He had a brother that would not take such a revenge. Now, Mount Norris claimed this meant that his brother would not impinge on the honour of the Lord Deputy, but Wentworth chose to interpret it instead as a threat and an insult. As a commissioned officer in the Irish army, this was a court martialable offence, and Wentworth received the King's permission to charge Mount Norris whenever he saw fit. After several more months of pressuring the Vice-Treasurer to resign, and after Mount Norris began accusing the Lord Deputy of mismanagement in letters to Charles, Wentworth had enough. Mount Norris was seized and brought before a court-martial, 
where he was found guilty of inciting mutiny and calumniating against his superior officer. His sentence? To be stripped of his officers and put to death. Whether Wentworth actually wanted Mount Norris dead is unlikely. After he was suitably removed from his post, Wentworth would commute the sentence and set him free. He had what he wanted, after all. Mount Norris was no longer in the way, though it wasn't a resignation. However, news of this carried back to England, and both there and in Ireland it provided fodder for the Lord Deputy's enemies. New English at court resented Wentworth's encroachment on their wealth and power, and collaborated with his rivals. Such a drastic seizure of the tax farm only led to further scrutiny of how Wentworth was actually using it, and rumours spread in 1637 that the Attorney General was going to investigate him. Charles backed his Lord Deputy, however, appointing a new Lord Treasurer and defusing the situation. Wentworth used his previously agreed right to return to England later in the year, spending six weeks at court, during which he fully restored Charles's faith in him. This faith was vital to Wentworth's position, as he only continued to antagonise some very powerful people. If a courtier's agenda clashed with Wentworth's plans, the Crown's income, or the Lord Deputy's own benefit, he blocked it, regardless of the courtier's influence. One such case is that of the Earl of Arundel, who attempted to claim a stretch of land on the shoddy claim that an ancestor once owned it. Wentworth instead backed the Earl of Ormond, who stood to lose out. In return, one of Wentworth's friends and clients received one of the contested titles from Ormond. Arundel, like Cork, would get his revenge in due course. Wentworth accumulated a fortune in Ireland, while denying others the same right. His share in the customs farm, won after the conviction of Mount Norris, earned him almost £9,000 a year. He received more than £5,000 a year in rents on his Irish land. He stood to earn even more, with a proposed tobacco monopoly for Ireland in January 1638, though events would prevent him taking full advantage of this. Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and it's bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to babbel.com and use promo code Recorded History. That's B A. B-B-E-L dot com, code recorded history, Babel language for life. So far, we've seen how Wentworth's rule affected the New English and the Church of Ireland. These people might have held most of the political power within the Kingdom of Ireland, but they did not make up anywhere near a majority of its population. As you mentioned earlier and last episode, the vast bulk of the Irish population, whether Gaelic or Anglo-Irish, were Catholic. So, how did the latest Lord Deputy treat them? Initially, Wentworth followed a pragmatic line. He knew he would have to wrangle with the New English elites, in government and in the church, and it would be the height of foolishness to open up another front with the Catholics. 
We saw this in his reluctance to enforce recusancy fines. Wentworth also instituted de facto toleration for Catholicism, though notably not de jure, as was made insultingly apparent with the Graces. Nevertheless, despite this legal foot-dragging, under Wentworth, toleration became more common. The Lord Deputy reigned in the courts from prosecuting Catholics for performing their own funerals, baptisms, and weddings. Persecution of priests also relented, and so we see an increase in their number across Ireland, with the same trend applying to the religious orders. Franciscans, Cistercians, and even the hated Jesuits saw a renaissance in the shadow of unofficial official toleration. However, Lord Deputy Wentworth remained the same person he had been as Lord President of the North, though, incidentally, he kept this position while in Ireland. As Lord President, Wentworth had shown his Protestant credentials, and was quite willing to persecute Catholics if it was politically feasible or financially, or financially profitable. As Lord Deputy, Wentworth was playing the long game. Instead of applying pressure to the masses, which had proven stubbornly resistant to conversion for almost a century, he focused on the elites. If the Anglo-Irish and Gaelic-Irish lords could be successfully converted to Protestantism, then at a stroke, the largest font of financial and political support for Catholicism would be blocked. With Protestant lords, their clients would follow suit, and the religious orders which relied on them would lose out. Catholicism would wither on the vine, while the one true faith would only grow stronger. Such was Wentworth's theory, anyway. But how to do this? Well, now we return to the policy of plantation. Wentworth had burnt many bridges with his Catholic charges by refusing the land grace. He had lost their trust, but in return he kept his single greatest weapon in the conversion of the Irish. Without an Irish Concealment Act, Catholic landlords without valid legal titles could face ruin. Wentworth began a plantation in Connacht, where the mostly Catholic inhabitants were ordered to surrender their property to the Crown. The Crown would then re-grant three quarters of it back, along with a valid title. Alongside this smaller parcel of land, the landlords would owe the King a payment in lieu of military service. The withheld quarter of land would then be granted to Protestant settlers like other plantations. Where this plays into Wentworth's long game is in the terms of the re-grant. They stipulated that the re-granted land could only be inherited if the heir took the oath of supremacy. This was the oath which acknowledged the king as the supreme governor of the church, and so was incompatible with Catholicism. In theory, within a generation, the landed nobility would have to be Protestant. With both Irish and settler landowners Protestant, the support for Catholic clergy would dry up, and Protestant conversion could proceed with little organised resistance. And hey presto, the third Stuart kingdom would gain a Protestant majority, with the added benefits of bringing in revenue to the crown and civilising the population along English lines. Had the crown been in better financial shape and plantation not presented a lucrative source of revenue, perhaps the graces would have been passed due to the domestic peace they offered. With the graces, Catholicism would have greater legal standing. However, this was not to be. As Russell puts it, Irish Catholicism was being slowly sacrificed, not so much to English anti-popery as to the poverty of the English exchequer. Naturally, this approach was resisted. Wentworth simply stated that the king's title to land was the default when no other title could be proven, and in Raskamen, Sligo, and Mayo, most resistance to plantation was overwhelmed. However, in Galway, the fourth Earl of Clanricard, Richard Burke, was the chief landowner. Clanricard was also Earl of St Albans in England, where he resided, and so was a member of the English peerage, though for now we'll stick to calling him Clanricard. In 1635, Wentworth began proceedings in Galway against Clanricard to enforce the surrender and re-grant, but the Earl held significant local influence. The jury found in favour of their Earl, and against Wentworth and the King. 
Hopefully, the jury believed that loyalty was its own reward, because for their loyalty, they were prosecuted by Castle Chamber and imprisoned. The sheriff who had picked them was also imprisoned, and he would die in jail. Clanricard donned his St Albans hat and dispatched an appeal to the king, and used what allies at court he had to damage Charles's faith in his Lord Deputy. Clanricard would never see the result of his resistance, as he died in November 1635. Finally, the jurors submitted to Wentworth and accepted the king's title. They were released at the end of 1636. However, the new Earl of Clanricard, Ulickburg, was not done yet. While debts forced him to compromise and influence other Galway landowners to do likewise, he continued to resist. His allies at court eventually convinced Charles of the folly of needlessly aggravating one of his most powerful Irish subjects while trying to enforce his will in Scotland. In February 1639, the new Clan Rickard had his lands confirmed and exempted from plantation, and Wentworth had won yet another powerful enemy. When the Long Parliament was assembling, Clan Rickard wrote that, When Parliament doth sit, the day will come he shall pay for all. While Clan Rickard may not have been able to win the legal battle, his resistance was a valuable speed bump for his fellow Anglo-Irish landowners. Connacht was not to be the end of Wentworth's plantation policy, and he had hoped to begin implementing it across Ireland, including the Anglo-Irish heartlands of the Pale and Linster. Yet, Connacht had been so doggedly contested that Wentworth ran out of time, as events in Scotland took precedent. Of course, plantation was a long-standing policy of English rule in Ireland, and we covered it extensively in the last season. As we saw, the official requirements of plantation, fortification, investment, Protestant conversion, often fell to the wayside as undertakers and servitors attempted to earn back their investment. Lands seized from Gaelic and Anglo-Irish, and then granted to English and Scottish planters, were meant to be settled with imported colonists from England and Scotland. However, it was much easier and much better value to keep Irish tenants on the land. Colonists had been hard to find ever since the American colonies began to take off, and the Irish, well, they were already there. So by the 1630s and 40s, the various Irish plantations consisted of islands of English and Scots, outnumbered by their Gaelic neighbours. There were always those willing to broadcast how planters had failed in their mission. One such critic was Sir Thomas Phillips, who had had his land in Coleraine granted to the companies of London to settle, alongside the eponymous Londonderry. Phillips eagerly reported the failures of the undertakers to meet the requirements of their charters. Over the years since his dispossession, Phillips built up a large portfolio of evidence, and in 1631, the king ordered Star Chamber to investigate. Hell hath no fury, like a landlord scorned. The investigation took four years, but in 1635, the Commission of Inquiry prosecuted the City of London for failing to keep the terms of their charter. The charter and ownership of Londonderry, Coleraine, and the surrounding 40,000 acres were revoked from the companies, and the city was fined £75,000 though this was later reduced to only £12,000. Where did all that land go? Why, to the Crown, of course. Wentworth, who had not been behind the inquiry, but nevertheless saw its advantages, urged the King to have the land farmed, and was willing to take out the lease from Charles himself. Instead, Charles appointed a commission to govern the land on his behalf, which made the questionable decision in 1639 to revise the tenancy agreements en masse and increase rents across the board. If this made the government no friends in Ireland, the same can be said for London. Considering that the city had been reluctant to get involved in the plantation scheme and had to be strong-armed into it by James, to now be punished and humiliated for failing to meet royal standards was galling. The City of London had yet another grievance to hold against the King. The plantation policy appeared to be working. It had been relatively peaceful, 
and a certain level of anglicisation seemed to be taking place. Now firmly established, settlers had begun expanding out of their plantation communities, absorbing and assimilating their Gaelic neighbours and bringing Protestantism and quote-unquote civilization to them. Yet this success was only surface deep. When violence erupted in 1641, the old divisions would become bloodily apparent. Before we end today's episode and return across the North Channel to Scotland, we should take a quick look at what Ireland looked like after several years of Wentworth as Lord Deputy. The population of Ireland had reached 1.5 million by 1641. Dublin doubled in size, from 10,000 in 1600 to 20,000 in 1640. The Irish economy appeared to be booming, with exports of hides, wool, butter and beef increasing by many orders of magnitude. A small manufacturing economy was in its early years, with iron smelting, glass making and cloth weaving industries. Most of those profiting from these developments were the New English, but a substantial number of Anglo-Irish as well as some Gaelic Irish were generating significant profits from this upturn. At least one of Wentworth's aims to make Ireland financially self-sufficient was achieved. In 1638, Ireland was subsidising the English treasury rather than the reverse, and the Lord Deputy boasted a surplus of £100,000. While the Graces had been aborted by Wentworth, the unofficial toleration for Catholics had improved the lot of many in Ireland. The Catholic clergy, from priests to bishops, were generally allowed to conduct their duties unmolested. Irish Catholics could serve as lawyers, and Wentworth would recruit Catholics as officers in the army. Plantation had been an official policy, but had been delayed in places and defeated in others. The policy had neither been outright defeated through the graces, nor had it won outright. There was still hope that it could be ended, and the rights of loyal subjects, Catholic or Protestant, could be secured. Those are the positives and they help explain why Wentworth and the crown he represented received so much support in the coming crises. There had been enough benefits, and there remained enough hope that cooperation with the government was seen by many as the path to the best future. However, this is only one side of the coin. Wentworth's policies had upset almost every faction in Irish politics. Conforming Protestants, as well as Ulster Presbyterians, had found their ceremonies and churches interfered with by the Crown, often leading to much higher costs for parishioners, with unpopular changes enforced from above. Catholics, of course, had held on to the hope of the Graces for many years, and the Lord Deputy's contemptuous betrayal only heightened their importance. The New English had seen their interests overruled and undermined by Wentworth. The Anglo-Irish feared the Lord Deputy's agents arriving to confiscate their property, and the Gaelic Irish remained largely shut out of power entirely. Wentworth had simultaneously heightened the grievances of each group to the others, while also giving them all motives for a shared hatred of him. Quite the achievement. As we will see, this will have consequences for the Lord Deputy personally, and the Kingdom of Ireland as a whole. If you're looking for something to listen to in the meantime, go check out the Ages of Conquest podcast. Thanks to my House of Lords, the King's favourite, Andrew Shoemaker, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Royal Headsman, executed today, the Duke of Clarence, Rory Martin, the Duke of Ormond, Brendan Bonner, the Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer, the Marquess of Hereford, Christopher Remo, the Marquess of Queensbury, Brent Sitz, the Marquess of Southampton, Alan Goldstein, the Marquess of Dorset, Thomas Kessler, the Marquess of Annandale, Duncan McHale, the Marquess of Montague, Brandon Stansbury, the Marquess of Londonderry, Evan, Dexter, Viscount Wicklow, and Luke, Baron Linnet Howells. If you want to join their ranks, please go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. All patrons get an ad-free feed. Thank you to everyone who's left a review on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, or your favourite podcast app. Remember, you can get in touch with me on Facebook, Twitter, and by email. Thanks again to my entire House of Lords, to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music used in today's episode, and to you for listening.